All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we do, I'm not sure how this is going to work. I usually say, with some degree of truth, really, that I want to get a photo of everybody just so I can prove to my boss that I'm actually here working uh, versus just taking in the coffee scene. My boss is actually here, so I technically don't have to do this, but I love to get a photo of you folks so I can just, I don't know, just memories, right? Okay, so I'm going to, I, by the way, um, those of you who know me know that I used to work on the spring team, uh, and now I work for Microsoft, so I've tried to come up with something fun to say, uh, and Azure, Microsoft, it doesn't work well for smiling. Boot just looks like somebody, everybody's booing me, so that's even worse. Uh, so I, I'm just gonna go with spring, okay? So spring, anyway. So let's try that. I'm gonna, I guess, try to get kind of like a couple shots here. Uh, for those of you walking in, if you wanna be on camera and famous, Andra, hey, hey. <laughs> so uh, yeah, famous, famous uh, on Twitter. Uh, step right up, so let's see if I can switch this, and let's see. Oh, that, that's actually not bad with the lights the way they are. So everyone say spring. spring. All right, so let's try this on the other side now, okay. So by the way, I'm a worse photographer than, than I am a joke teller, so this probably won't even turn out, but, but we'll try. Okay, on this side, spring. spring. All right, so we'll try. We'll try. Hopefully at least one of those will turn out, and if not, well, again, we tried. Okay, so... Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session on Das Boot, diving into debugging Spring Boot applications. <sighs> really? Okay. Uh, that brought the house down in Germany, folks. I don't know. This is going to be a tough crowd. Uh, das Boot. Das Boot. Uh, what's one more terrible metaphor on the, term, on the word boot, right? I swore I would never do that, but it's like, eh, why not? Uh, so I wanted to get into diving into debugging. <sighs> Di yeah. Anyway, debugging, or really more accurately, finding the truth. Uh, if you are a senior developer, if you're a junior developer, uh, we all make these mistakes. Hopefully we make them less frequently as we get further along in our careers. However, we still make assumptions, we still take shortcuts. And if you are a junior developer, if you're just starting out in this field, there's nothing that stops you from uh, there's no time limit, right? There's no time constraint. There's no, it'll take you three years or five years or 10 years to get to the point where you actually insist on truth, insist on knowing the problem and fixing the problem versus vigorously attacking symptoms. You can learn this stuff in days or weeks. Uh, and for those of you who've been around the block a, a few times, there are <laughs> many times we get caught up in assumptions as well. So it's very good to kind of revisit some of these things, I think, and, and make sure that we always are dealing with truths, verifiable truths versus just assumptions. Uh, my name, is, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal cloud advocate of Java and JVM languages with Microsoft. Again, I came from the Spring team. I was with Pivotal for a number of years in VMware, and now I work at Microsoft doing a lot of the same things, get to play with a lot of the same cool tech, just I have a bigger toy box now, deal with the same folks on the Spring team. I just can't talk to them in the personal, you know, behind-the-scenes chat uh, Slack channel. So, uh, yeah, it's all, you know, different communications channels. It's Teams now. Uh, anyway. So if you, uh, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, by all means, reach out to me. Uh, please do save any, any of the questions, comments, or feedback to the end because I've got a lot of material I'm going to try to fit in. We only have three hours today. Okay, it's a little worse than that, 50 minutes. Uh, so it's going to be pretty, pretty lean, right? Uh, but what I want to do is start the conversation. There's absolutely no way I can get into all the things that I want to talk about in 50 minutes. I, I am overly optimistic when it comes to, I think I can get all this in, and you realize, or I realize really quickly, that I'd rather cover fewer things better than many things worse. So we'll cover what we can and start the conversation, and then I'm happy to carry it on after the fact. Because we may only have 50 minutes now, but we have a couple more days here, and then we have a nearly unlimited time afterwards. So let's just get the ball rolling. Uh, if you do think of things after the fact, if you're like me, 10 minutes after you walk out the door, that's when you think of your question, that's when you think of the comment or, or feedback. Uh, again, I do that all the time. So uh, reach out to me by email if you must, or better yet, on Twitter. Um, those of you who uh, follow me on Twitter know that I kind of live on Twitter. I check email occasionally, but I live on Twitter. Uh, those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, I guess the first question I ask is, why? Why? Uh, Twitter is the place to be, right? I, frankly, it's not just me. I think it's the best way to just reach out and touch somebody and get a hold of them quickly. My DMs are open, so even if you just join, uh, if anybody here isn't on Twitter, I mean, occasionally that happens, uh, if you just join and follow me and send me a DM, I will get it. So, so by all means, 
please do let's keep the communication going so hello there we go <laughs> I'm already, I, I, I'm getting wound up, and I guess that's good for the pace, but I don't want to go too fast here. So a bit about me, I am an architect and developer by, by trade, background, history. Uh, obviously, I'm an advocate as well. I, I have uh, co-authored a couple of books, contributed content and code to several other books. I swore, I swore to myself after co-authoring a couple of books, I would never solo author a book because it is a lot of work, even to co-author, right? Even when you have a great team of co-authors, it's a lot of work, right? Yes, it is. So I swore I'd never do that. So last year, guess what I did? Anyway, I break my own promises to myself, but I, I you know, I, eas I forgive easily. So uh, I, have, uh, I am also a Java champion, Java One Rockstar, Grand Breaker Ambassador, Kotlin Developer Expert, and a licensed pilot. Uh, that was something that I'd always wanted to do. Finally, a couple of years ago, wrapped it up, went on for my instrument rating. So I'm an instrument rated private pilot. I don't do that for a job. I do it for fun, right? It's a great way to change your perspective and literally, literally change your perspective and see things from, uh, well, I'm from the US, right? From a few thousand feet altitude, right? So uh, this is the book. Uh, so Spring Boot Up and Running released last year. I'm already in talks with my editor. They're trying to chase me down to do an update. I suppose I probably should do that uh, because we got some cool stuff coming up in the next version of Spring Framework and Spring Boot. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about that, if you're not, that's fine too. But if you are, uh, that link will take you right to the O'Reilly site where you can get, I think it's a seven or 14 day free trial of Safari Books Online and check it out. Or if you have a corporate plan or you can buy it or whatever. Uh, and the book has a Twitter account, so you might want to follow the book. Anyway, <laughs> the plan for this afternoon. I love a good quote. I wish I were witty enough to, to create them. As you will find out today, I, I, if I have one superpower, it's telling bad jokes. And I did say bad jokes. My wife will tell me dad jokes every, every day, and even I groan, but I think mine are worse. I don't know, we'll, we'll find out, so sit tight. Uh, so I like a good quote. Leonard Bernstein, the uh, former conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra and a composer uh, several years ago wrote this, or, or said this, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan, and not quite enough time. And I think we have both of those today. So let's, li let's dive in. Today on the agenda, we're gonna be talking about Spring Boot and application startup in Spring Boot. We're going to talk about bean initialization and configuration. And we're going to debug local apps via IDE. Now, <laughs> this is not a waterfall approach. We're gonna be doing all these things kind of together simultaneously, uh, iterating through them. Uh, and I, I am actually going to be using hopefully very simple constructs, very simple examples. And the reason I'm doing that is very deliberate because I don't want to focus on the example. Uh, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I actually spin a lot of code, uh, write it all by scratch and have a very cool domain. It's flying related. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but today I really want to distill this to, to keep it very simple so we can talk about the, the, the good stuff, the stuff behind the scenes. Um, so, um, so we're going to be doing that. I'm going to be using Actuator for additional insights and clarity because uh, in today's world of distributed applications, it's not always about stepping through things in your debugger, in your IDE. So we'll do a little bit of that. We'll also do a little bit of actuator work and using examples to kind of bring out some, again, very simply, but to show some of the, the conflicts that we have to deal with as developers in complex systems. Uh, and then we'll talk about and show debugging remote applications at least a, a smidge. We'll see. I always, or, well, I, I always, uh, I typically run out of time toward the end, so I have hopes that we can at least touch on that. But, but if not, again, we'll talk about it later after the fact. So let's dive into the code. Does anyone recognize this? I, I mean, this here in London, I'm going to be very disappointed if I don't see a few hands. So I've got a few. That's it? Really? Oh, that's better. Thank goodness. Whew, my people. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I spoke somewhere. Um, and I love that slide. I love that episode, actually. But I spoke somewhere right before the pandemic, BCT, before COVID time. And I don't remember where it was. It was a Latin American country. And they said, we don't have that on Netflix. And it's like, you've got to check. I'm not encouraging you to pirate anything. Please don't misunderstand me. But you have to find that show. That is brilliance. So anyway. All right. So let's go here. Um, we're going to start off uh, at the Spring Initializer. This is the place where you don't have to go here to create a Spring Boot application, but this is typically the place you do go because it makes life simple for you as a developer. And, and as you see, this is all about Spring and Spring Boot are all about making things simple for you as a developer. 
Um, and, and there's a flip side to that, and we'll talk about that as we go as well. So let me blow that up. That's a bit small. Uh, that's reasonable, right? Okay. So I'm going to keep things, again, fairly simple, fairly down the middle of the road, um, because uh, you have options creating Spring Boot applications. <coughs> but for our purposes, they all work pretty much the same. So I'm going to uh, use Java for my language and, and Maven for my build system. Uh, if you're a hipster, please feel free to use Gradle. It's all, it's all good. Uh, but I'm going to stick with Maven today. Again, it works the same. 2.6, uh, 2.6.7 for our, our uh, Spring Boot version, the current version. I'm going to just change this group to thehecklers.com because why not? That's my domain. And we'll call this Das Boot. Das Boot. Wow, the puns are just terrible, I know. But uh, thanks for sticking with me. So Das Boot project. And we're going to use jar packaging because it is 2022 after all. <sighs> anyway, um, if, you, uh, if you are using war packaging, you're probably using it because you have to. That's fine. It is what it is. But this is Spring Boot, and it's most effectively packaged up as a jar, so we'll go with that. I'm also going to use the current LTS version of Java, which is 17. But as you see, Spring Boot does support all the way back. This version of Spring Boot, anyway, does support all the way back to Java 8. And the current version of Java, which is 18, but the LTS, the latest long-term supported version of Java, is 17. So we'll go with that. And then I'm going to bring in just a couple of dependencies. Again, we're going to keep this pretty lean today, uh, Spring Web. And then I'm also going to bring in Actuator. And then let's generate our project. So I'm going to drop that on the desktop. Oh, I have another one there. Let's see. Huh, that's interesting. Well, let's just, let's fix that. Move to trash. There we go. All right, so let's try that again. Ha, 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 ha. And we'll drop that on the desktop. Opening with complete. Wow, that was slow. I mean, the internet was so good earlier. So, so there is our project. Let's open it up. And our favorite IDE, NetBeans. Ha, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I always feel bad when I make a joke like that. It, bad though it may be, because uh, people think that I'm dissing NetBeans. I love NetBeans. NetBeans is a great editor, has great Java and Spring Boot support. Uh, I pick on my friends, right? So, so please don't take that personally. Uh, but NetBeans is a great editor. Uh, so it's, it's fine. I use IntelliJ. We might as well get that out of the way early. I am a Microsoft person running on a Mac using IntelliJ. I know probably some of you won't hear a word I say after this because you're just still trying to process that. What the heck? But Microsoft is very pragmatic. Uh, Microsoft wants to be your cloud destination of choice, so we get to use what we want, what works, which is what we all do every day, right? So that's good. Uh, but IntelliJ is an awesome, uh, awesome IDE, so uh, I, I like to use that. Um, uh, VS Code, by the way, I use VS Code frequently, so VS Code is a great IDE as well. Uh, it started off a little bumpy, but by now it's a really, really solid and good uh, productive Java IDE. I use it all the time as well, but still, IntelliJ is my daily driver. Uh, Eclipse, uh, well, Eclipse is also an IDE. <sighs> Eclipse is like, you've seen the, 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 the thing, the, the drawing, right, where they make that Swiss Army knife and it's like a hundred blades or a million, I don't know, it's just really wide. And, and that's Eclipse. You know there's a blade in there to do anything you want to do, but you can't find that blade. It takes forever to find that blade. So I don't know. If you use Eclipse, hats off to you. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, you can use Vim. Uh, please don't use Emacs, though. Have a little bit of self-respect. So, okay, now I've got half the audience mad at me. That's cool. I've done, my work here is complete. Okay, so, so let's get started. I'm going to use IntelliJ again, and I'm going to just open the palm. Uh, so again, I use Maven, so we have a palm.xml. I'm also going to just open a couple other things, application properties and our main uh, application class. <sighs> so um, where do we want to start? Well, okay, let's, let's start here. Cognizant of time, because again, there's so much. So, so a Spring Boot application. Has anybody ever heard the complaint that Spring Boot is just too much magic? No one. Okay, uh, <laughs> say, uh, just kidding. Uh, so, so this always frustrates me a little bit, right? Because there is no magic. We are technologists, so guess what it is? It's, it's science and technology. Uh, but most of you probably came, like I did, from another technology, right? Where it's much more imperative. You, you have to say not just what you want done, but how to do it. And when you, uh, when you come to uh, spring, it can feel a bit jarring. A, a bit jarring. Wow! Oh my gosh, that's a tough crowd. 
I told you my jokes were bad, okay? I mean, that's, but you got it, right? Okay, just checking. So, so it, does, it, it does feel a bit jarring uh, because you, you have a lot of things that are done for you. And, and initially when you see that, it feels weird, right? You're thinking, I'm missing so much. What's happening? I don't like this. I feel uncomfortable. But let's demystify this a little bit because I think that goes a long way to realizing that this is just very, very, again, developer focused, very straightforward. So this looks very much like any job application, right? To some degree, you've got your public static void main. Uh, we see here that we've got our spring application dot run, which is a static method, which you're, you're running uh, your application here, and we'll dive into that in a moment. Uh, but we also see here this one annotation, right? At spring boot application. And you're thinking, that's gotta have a lot of magic because just one line and it does all kinds of wondrous things for me, right? Well, let's, let's dissect this a little bit. So I'm gonna just, uh, command B in IntelliJ, which drills you into it, right? So we'll look at our, our code behind the code, if you will. So this is what a, a, an annotation at Spring Boot application consists of. Really three different annotations that, as, far as, uh, of, as far as meat go. Uh, apologies to vegans. So here we've got at Spring Boot configuration. And we also have at enable auto configuration and then at component scan. So let's take these one step at a time and quickly address what they are. So I'm gonna drill into this a little bit, a little bit further. So we'll drill into the, uh, whoops, the at Spring Boot configuration. And we see that it actually uh, is an alias for the configuration class. So you see that right there? So let's drill into that. And we see that at configuration is what? It's an at component. So we've got a couple of things in play here. Really distilling it to its essence, at Spring Boot configuration means that as a configuration class, you can define bean creation methods within. So you can do something to create beans within that class. As, an, as, as a component, it also means that it also is a bean. So Spring Beans, they are placed into an application context, sometimes referred to as your uh, dependency injection container or your, uh, <laughs> sometimes colloquially referred to as the bean bucket. Right? So these are the, the spring beans that are actively managed by spring behind the scenes. But we see that, that the spring boot application itself is a component, so you've got a bean for that, and then you can create other beans within that. We'll come back to that. I just wanted to point that out really quickly as we went. So let's go back and look at our at enable auto configuration. So if we drill into that, I guess really there's not much to drill into at this point other than to say that your, your auto configuration this is the jarring part, really, and no pun intended with that, because um, when you have auto configuration, what happens is, um, well, let's, let's take it back. If you, anybody come from the uh, Java E world? Probably a lot of us came from that world, right? So if you wanted to issue a query against a data store, let's say you just wanted to get a count of rows in a table, how would you do that? Well, you, you have a several step dance that you typically would perform, right? You define a connection pool. You have a, a database driver you're dealing with for a particular database technology behind the scenes. You establish a connection. Uh, you you uh, issue the query, you close the connection. And I'm, I'm omitting a few steps just because of the pain of it all. But these, these things, the first time you do them seem really, they seem like a lot, right? You're doing a lot of steps just to get a count of rows in a table just to find out how many customers you have, active customers. It's a lot of, of work, a lot of boilerplate. So the first time you go through it, you think, wow, that's painful. So you do it again and again. And by the 10th or 50th or however many times, you feel that that's normal just because that's how it has to be done. You do that all the time. So one of the spring projects is called Spring Data. And you have different types of Spring Data projects. So Spring Data JPA, Spring Data Mongo, Spring Data Neo4j, so on and so forth. Uh, Cassandra, et cetera, et cetera. With, with Spring Boot and its auto configuration, what happens is it will look for a database driver on your class path. So let's say I have Mongo in there as an example. And then I, I extend a Spring Data Repository interface in my code. Just extend it. I don't do anything other than define an interface, extend CRUD repository, for instance, or JPA repository or Mongo repository. Spring Boot's auto configuration says, look, you have a, the Mongo driver on your class path. You have a Mongo repository you're extending. I bet you want to talk to Mongo. That is not magic. Those are very solid assumptions that are made by the Spring team to make our lives easier. So that when we want to issue a command just to find out how many customers we have, 
it's very simple. We don't have to go through the opening, closing, establish connections, not establishing, you know, disconnecting. We just issue the query. So it's really, really nice. And again, when you do the same thing the same way, 10 out of 10 times, these are assumptions that really should be made across a lot of different tools. Once you start seeing that, you go, yeah, why, why isn't that easier and everything else? So that's kind of what auto configuration is. Now, I, I do want to very quickly dive into the POM. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, an aside, but I think it's very important to see because you see here at the top of our POM, we have the Spring Boot Starter Parent. This is a bill of materials. So what this is, is it, it what this is, is, uh, so, so if we drill into that, we see that we have uh, a, a list of dependencies, if you will. And then here we go to our Spring Boot dependencies and we drill into that and we can see that we have a lot of different potential dependencies that are evaluated to determine if they make sense for auto configuration for our application. So if you also notice at the top, we have version numbers. If we go back to our original POM, you probably also notice that we have zero version numbers indicated. And why is that? Because version numbers, each version of Spring Boot is tested. I like, I like to call it battle tested against a particular version of a particular potential dependency. So if it's been tested against that dependency, you don't have to provide a specific number. You can, if there's a compelling reason that you need to upgrade, but you don't have to, and you know that it's been, again, tested extensively against that. No, nothing's guaranteed, but you know it's probably going to work pretty well. And then each of these, uh, each of these dependencies is not loaded with your application. It's potentially loaded. It's evaluated to see if it makes sense. Uh, and then let's see if I can, um, uh, let's see, where did I have this? I'm trying to kind of cut a few corners for time. So this is the Spring, uh, actually the Spring Boot source code, right? Uh, or at least an excerpt of it, I should say. Uh, so I just did a search on conditional on missing bean. Because what happens, the auto configuration will check, and depending on what criteria you give it, if this bean is, is present or missing, if this property is present or missing, uh, and, and many other things as well, if this class is on the class path or not, it will load the particular um, things that you need to, to facilitate your development. So that's part of the auto configuration. I'll get into that a little bit more as we go. Um, but I'd just like to, to kind of uh, show that as, uh, as we st get started. So back to our POM, or excuse me, <coughs> our application. And the last thing, of course, is the component scan, because what we've talked about so far is the auto configuration and, of course, the, um, the configuration um, class itself and the configuration classes. But com at component scan means that you can define, rather than have bean creation methods, you can actually define a class and say this should be a bean make it a component. And simply by annotating that as at component or one of its aliases, like at service, um, at um, uh, repository, there are a couple more just right off the top of my head escape me. Um, that will tell Spring Boot in its auto configuration, or in its startup, I should say, uh, to go ahead and create that as a bean and add that to the uh, application context. Now, uh, the fact that you can exclude or include different packages uh, is great, but in most cases you want to look at everything from that package down, thus the, uh, the inclusion in that in at Spring Boot application. So, all right, that was a kind of a whirlwind tour, and even that I took longer than probably I expected to, but that's, uh, that's all good. So, uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, so let's take a look at the Spring application run. I'm going to drill into that. We see that that's a static method, which does what? It calls another static method, which then does what? It creates a new Spring application and calls the run method. And I think just due to time, I'm going to uh, just kind of step through this rather quickly here visually, and then we'll go ahead and start with some code here in a moment. But this is what happens when your, your application starts up. So if you've, if you've created a Spring Boot application, you know that it, it grabs a timestamp up front, and then at some point it shows you how long it took to start up. And that's very simple, it just grabs that uh, system time up front, and then it goes in and starts doing stuff. So it creates a bootstrap context, an empty one. It creates your application context. And by the way, this is another thing, I should, I should point this out before I get too far down this, uh, this trail. You see what this method returns? A configurable application context. Where is that? Where does that go? So let's, let's go back here. So it's very simple, actually. We just most of the time don't do anything with it, but it's right there. So we can do that if we want to, and that's a configurable application context. So that's how you get to it. That's how you can evaluate or, or manipulate your system variables and, and other things like that. Um, I just wanted to pop over and do that while I thought of it. 
Okay, uh, let's see. So create the empty context. Uh, initialize the listeners. Uh, indicate that they're starting. Oh, I forgot the configure headless property. This is very important because still in Java we have AWT baggage. I shouldn't say that. AWT is still present, so we need to say we don't need it. <laughs> um, and then we have, let's see, we do these following things. We process our, our in, uh, excuse me, our arguments. Uh, we establish our environment. We, oh, the banner. This is a really good example, um, very simple example. Uh, you will probably be sitting on my former colleague's talk, hopefully, later on this afternoon, Josh. Uh, he's very, very adamant that you should always keep the banner. I'm not going to argue. But should you ever decide you don't want to keep the banner and shave a few milliseconds off your time, uh, it doesn't really save much, but we can do this. So just by setting a property, that affects your startup. And again, that's part of that whole auto-configuration because you can set a property, you can define a bean, and Spring Boot's um, auto configuration will back off when it sees those things because it evaluates property present or, or, or absent, being present or absent, what have you. So that is a very simple way to manipulate that banner. Uh, again, create the context at the application startup, repair the context, refresh it, uh, do some things after refresh should you need to, want to, and then indicate the time that it took to do such. And then we um, uh, indicate that the listeners are started. Then we call the runners. Anyone familiar with application runner, command line runner? Does anybody know the difference? I always like to ask this. Uh, people, okay. Uh, uh, you want to throw it out? Uh, the arguments? The yes. Arguments. Yes. Now, so which one is more efficient? I think the command line runner. Oh, my gosh. I wish I had a free T-shirt to give you. Um, stop by the Microsoft booth. They've got, they've got to have some swag. Some, yeah, just, just tell them. Just Mark saying, you give me whatever you can. And if they give you better swag than I get, then I'm really going to be steen, but see what you can do. Um, so yes, uh, that was, that's one thing. I always lean to the command line runner because it doesn't actually, it, it just maintains that string array uh, of, of arguments. It doesn't actually do anything with them to manipulate them. And in most cases, you don't need to, right? So why go to the extra trouble? Again, it's so little overhead, but why, why do that, right? Okay, so uh, call the runners. And then we go down here and return the context. Okay. So let's get into this a little bit because we've set a lot of table. Uh, we've done a lot of background. But what I want to do is kind of get into this a little and just show you a few things. So again, remember, the Spring Boot application also is Spring Configuration, uh, Spring Boot Configuration, which is also Configuration, which means we can create, we can establish our bean creation methods here. So if we want to uh, create something, something, typing is out the window, return new... Wow, it's really bad. Something. It's going to be a long day. All right, so what the? Oh, that's much better. OK, yeah, typos. All right, so if we do a class something, yeah, much happier, right? So let's, let's keep this pretty simple. Uh, public something. Uh, let's just print out. Um, and I'm actually going to do this to make it a little easier. Uh, this is really something. I told you it wouldn't be necessarily that clever, but, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so let's run this, and let's make sure this works. Because, again, this is a configuration uh, class, so we can define means up here, right? I don't typically do that. I mean, it's kind of expedient. You can, and that's great, I guess. So, hey, this is really something. But whether you do this in your main application class or not, uh, you can also... Um, create a, a separate at configuration class, class app config, and we'll just dump that there. Same thing. Works the same. And then, if we really want to get crazy, see, this is really something. Works the same exact way. So we can actually do this differently. So I'm going to just, uh, just comment that, and we're going to uh, make this an at component and do the same thing. Oh, whoops. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it works, but you don't need that anymore. Um, yeah, so. So, this. Hmm. Need the post construct. Yeah. I'm sorry? You need the post construct in order to. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Hold on. 
has to be a public method. What? Oh, come on. I mean, I know I can yeah, post, construct. Yeah, I know, but I, I shouldn't really. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, now I see what's going on. Sorry. I just having a brain cramp there for a second here. Let's, let's remove that. So something, make sure I don't have anything else going on here. What's that? Duplicate class. Duplicate oh, well, that's the problem right there, isn't it? Yeah, so let's do that, add component. That makes things a lot happier. Thank you very much. OK. Whew. This is what happens when I get going too fast. I skip steps. So if you catch me skipping a step, awesome. Please let me know. <laughs> OK. So again, multiple ways to get there from here. All of these will create a bean, and all of these will place it into the application context. So let's, uh, let's take this a little bit farther here. So I'm going to make this a REST controller, which, by the way, let's drill into that. We see that a REST controller is a controller. And we drill into that, and we see that it is a component. <laughs> so this is still a beam. OK, so I'm going to make this a get mapping, and we'll return a string get, um, oh, get uh, status. Let's say status. And I'll get rid of that just to clean things up. And return, and we will say that uh, initializing bean, bean, and let's add this to um, bean name. All right. Where is bean name coming from, you might ask? Well, let's say we have a uh, private, well, let's make this a private string bean name. Okay, so if we do nothing with this, right, uh, we expect an error. But what I'm going to do now is just grab this, again, keeping things pretty lean here, I'm going to uh, bring in a value here. Um, whew, typing is just terrible. All right, and then uh, we'll call this bean name. Bean name. Whew. All right, now if we restart this, what do you think is going to happen? Bad things, right? I hope. I hope bad things. <laughs> this is one of the few times you actually wish for bad things. Because nowhere, we're looking for a value. We're looking for a property called bean name. And we haven't ever defined that anywhere. But what we can do is, is in the case that it's not there, we can set up a default. So bean name, we'll just call this bean name A, bean name alpha. And I, I was going to use names on this, but I find that everybody guesses a lot better when I make it you know, very distinct names. So I'm going to keep this very tight and, and harder to guess, because you know what's life without whimsy? Anybody recognize that quote? Really? No Sheldon Cooper fans. OK, well, that's just sad. All right, so let's see. So HTT pi 8080. There we go, initializing bean alpha, bean A. So that's cool, we've got our default. However, we really should or could have a sensible uh, property, sensible default property defined in application properties. So we'll say bean name equals, uh, let's call it Charlie, C. And if we restart, the fact that we've defined that somewhere means that uh, we can hopefully get that value. Now, here's where things other than the debugger come in. Oh, you know, I completely skipped over the debugging, didn't I? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> I told you this would not be a waterfall type of approach. Okay, so we've got a bean that we've defined here, a bean name. Now, I'm going to just go a little crazy at this point. Pardon me for that. You know what? This, this should be easier if I just do this. Oh, come on. There we go. So I'm going to do something that I will tell you right off the bat you should not do. I'm just doing it for expediency to give a bad example. So as they say, you're not totally useless. You can always serve as a bad example. That's my function today. So don't do this at home. Uh, but I'm going to create also an application.yaml file, .yml. You can also do yaml. Uh, Spring Boot processes those with a plum just as well. However, you really shouldn't mix that properties and .yaml files. So that's my disclaimer. So... Um, Come on. Uh, boy, it's not letting me add the comment. OK, that's fine. So bean name, and we'll call this um, x, so x-ray. So we've got this. Uh, so let's see. We're going to go ahead and run this. Oh, you know what? I need to do one other thing first before I go back and start this, because this is another thing you should never do at home. We'll get to this. Uh, I mentioned actuator. I mentioned getting to the source of truth. When you start, and many times you have multiple values coming in to a particular portion of your application. 
How many times have you either done this to yourself or had a colleague call you up and say, I'm just having trouble. I cannot figure out what's happening here. Okay, unwind it for me. Tell me what's going on. Well, it's doing this and this and this. How do you know? Well, it has to be because I'm not getting anything back from this, this, this request. Do you know? What are you feeding it? Well, it has to be this because I'm getting nothing back. And many times, again, especially seniors, we see <laughs> senior moment, right? But we get into this mindset that we've seen this before. So we just short circuit right to the answer, but the answer doesn't work. The solution we've employed a dozen times no longer works because we're operating under bad assumptions, right? Don't do that to yourself. Save yourself hours or days or weeks of work by actually verifying what's happening. So with Actuator, you can actually get in, they call it, uh, they talk about it uh, being production ready. So you get um, production feedback for your application. Um, with Actuator, by default, there are only a couple of endpoints that are exposed, right? Just one that lets you define health and one that says it's up or down. It's an info endpoint. I think I have that reversed. Anyway, uh, so you have those and that's it because Actuator can give a lot of information about your application to people you don't want to have that information. It can be very dangerous. However, for a developer, it's a gold mine. So I'm going to open things up with Actuator because you can use Spring Security and secure the endpoints and open up limited ones. Uh, I'm just going to kick down the door, right? <laughs> so we're going to see everything. But please, please, please do not, do not do this at home. There be... Dragons here. I do that because I don't want anyone saying, how, did, how do I make that work? Oh yeah, Mark showed this. Don't do that. Please don't do that in production. Uh, but it is a great tool to actually see what's happening behind the scenes. Because now you've probably forgotten what I put where, right? There's a method of my madness. So what, what are we going to get? And from where is that value going to show up? See, it's insidious, right? You don't know. We don't know that. So let's go here and we'll do a local host 8080. Oops. Oh, I gave it away. Okay, well, anyway, actuator. So let's go to the actuator. Now, the actuator has, again, multiple endpoints, very useful endpoints. These are things that, you, again, you don't want to necessarily show everyone. Uh, so things like your environment. Um, <laughs> you can do heap dump, thread dump, uh, various different mappings. Uh, but, but today, we're going to focus on our environment. And if we go to the top and we search for bean name, bean name, we see that the top, end, the top one rules. That's the one that overrides everything else. So we know we're going to need to get C because we know that's at the top. However, we also have another bean name that's coming in from another place, right? It's down here on the class path resource on the application YAML. Now, the really great thing about Actuator, again, one, it allows you to verify exactly what you're getting, but it also tells you exactly from where it comes. So we see it's coming from the application.properties file, line two, column 10. So that's our value. So if we go to line two, that is our properties file, column 10. And then I'm going to uh, just zoom in on that. Whoops, let's see. Line two, column 10, right there. So it allows you to very quickly establish where that's coming from. We also see that the backup one is coming from application.yaml line one, column 11. And we see that, yes, indeed, that's the case, line one, column 11. So that's really nice. Now, again, that's semi-useful in this context, but let's kick it up a notch. So, um, didn't intend for this to be kind of a, 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 a way that Spring Boot processes uh, environment variables, but this is kind of a, a nifty way of showing this very cleanly and very easily. So, let's say that, let's see, desktop, dashboard. Oh, that's good. Okay, so I'm going to uh, do a couple of things here. So, I'm going to, let's see, Maven, Clean package. All right, so I'm going to build this. And then I'm going to just throw a few other things out here. So I'm going to export bean name equals, uh, let's make this F. All right, and then let's uh, go into our target directory and let's do a code application.properties, and we'll pull that up in uh, VS Code. And let's say that the bean name equals, uh, let's make that T, save that. All right, and we'll go here and we'll do an export, export uh, spring application JSON equals, 
tick, um, quote, bean name, colon, let's go crazy, shall we? Uh, and let's make this uh, W, and there we go. And now let's run this, right? So Java dash jar, and we have our dash bot, and we do um, bean name equals uh, R. Okay. Now let's uh, let's let's play. So this this is a very simple. I mean, this should be a very simple scenario, right? But this actually mirrors in a much larger scale what happens a lot of times in production applications. You don't know where these values are coming from or even exactly what value you're getting. You can assume, you can make assumptions, and sometimes you're right, and you can cut right to the chase. But many times you're wrong, and then you spend a lot of time just wasting time. So this is where things like, again, debugging, like actuator, come into being. So I'm going to refresh this and go to the top of our environment, and then we'll search for bean name, and we see what? If I can type, we see that the value is R, and we see exactly where it's coming from, the command line arguments, right? And then if we go on down, we see that the next one actually would come from the Spring application JSON, because we can define JSON and pass. That's absorbed from our environment as well. Uh, and that would be W if we went on down the list. If those weren't there, we would be pulling it from our system environment property, which is just the export bean name that I created earlier. Uh, and then, of course, application properties, the external application.properties file that I placed in the target directory, right? Uh, and then from there, of course, our application properties, application YAML. So you're probably wondering if there's some place that all this is documented, and indeed it is. Uh, this is kind of off the beaten path for the talk, but obviously it's something I've used for the talk. Uh, so if you go to the Spring Boot documentation, externalized configuration, uh, Spring Boot applications will look for your, your configuration properties, your environment properties in all of these different places. In this case, it goes down the list, actuator, it lists the prioritized uh, elements at the top, it overrides. Uh, but this is exactly what happens. It'll go down through these and process these and last in wins. So that was a, a little off the track, but I find it's very useful because, again, actuator lets you determine exactly what you're dealing with. And that way you're fixing problems, not vigorously attacking symptoms, right? Okay, so let's see. Let me, let me double check and make sure anything else that I wanted to catch on that. Uh, the remote debugging, I think, is the only thing that I have left that I really wanted to show. However, what I could do also, before I even get to the remote debugging, uh, whoops, well, here, I'll just do this. There we go. Okay. Uh, you know, I did say I would, because I, I do have time to actually do this. <laughs> so I do want to show you, let's see if I go to the Spring application. Uh, call runners. Okay, so I do want to jump in here and just let you know. Again, it's kind of that last in win, so let's see. Oh, I need to stop this at here. Control C. All right. Uh, very quick detour into this. It's it's just something nice to see. It's not an absolutely have to. Oh, I do. Oh, I did forget one thing that I really, really want to show you. Uh, so before I dive into that. So I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of auto configuration happening on your behalf, right? So if we go here and we go into our context, click. I find it helps when you make the noises for it. Click, sound effects. Okay, anyway. Well, it helps me anyway. <laughs> okay, so here's the bean definition map. I'm actually going to go down to the names. If I didn't already skip past it, let me zoom back out. Uh, Bean definition names, yeah, it's a little, little more manageable. So we see, I guess this is the first thing to look at. How many beans did we create? One. How many beans do we have? A few more than one, right? Okay, so, so what is Spring Boot doing to you, or for you, excuse me? Uh, and it is doing it for you, right? It's doing it for me, because what it's doing is saying, hey, you, you brought in uh, the, the uh, web, right? Uh, Spring Web. Uh, you brought an actuator, and there are going to be certain things that you need, certain beans that you need to be created to work on your behalf. How much did I have to do to configure any of that? Really nothing, right? Especially actuator. I mean, I, I put in one property to say, give me everything, but if I hadn't put that in, actuator would still work. It just would secure everything but a couple of fairly innocuous endpoints. So it's all in there, and it's all done for you based on certain conditions. Uh, so all those beans are created on your behalf. Now, again... Uh, you notice you never saw a banner in there because I had a property defined. So it checked for the existence of a property. If it was set to off as I set it, 
uh, as I did set it that way, it, it would not go ahead and load the banner, but that's exactly what it does. Spring Boot Auto Configuration backs off and doesn't take that action if there's a presence of a bean, uh, absence of a bean, property, et cetera. So I do like to kind of show that because I think people don't realize sometimes how much is done for you, and that is a good thing. The reason I focus so much on the, the beans and the components is that in spring, in the world of spring, most of what you do is, is approaching things from that angle, right? You're not doing these laborious, long sets of code in many cases, at least as far as your, your program execution, you're defining things to happen. And the, the application context kind of, I, it's a very imprecise way of putting it, but it kind of makes that happen on your behalf. Okay, so uh, I guess just to uh, drill into the call runners uh, very quickly. Oh, it just, oh, I stepped over. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Uh, this will be a very quick detour. Five minutes, okay, well, then it will be a very quick detour. So I will step into that. And as you can see, it basically just runs, it adds the runners, the application runners, the command line runners, and then runs through those. Again, very, very simply done. All right, now, to get into the remote debugging. Uh, so, what, uh, I'll do this in IntelliJ, but basically every, every IDE has a similar type of facility. There are gonna be many times that uh, you can't just debug what's on your machine. Obviously, we like to keep it that way as long as possible and as much as possible, but there are gonna be times you're going to need to uh, attach to and debug something remotely, whether it's on a remote uh, VM, bare metal, uh, container, and it all works similarly. It's a little more painful using a container. <laughs> uh, I can show you kind of what's involved with that, uh, but, um, but it's a little more involved for that. So I'm gonna edit the configurations, and I'm going to uh, create a new one here using the remote JVM and debug. We'll call this cleverly enough remote debug. And we see right here, let me just zoom in on that, the command line arguments for the remote JVM we need to provide, right? So I'm gonna copy those. It's a very simple operation, really. Uh, so if we go here, somebody's laughing. It, it is, it's simple, really, <laughs> it is, trust me. Uh, so I'm just going to prepend that. And then, of course, since I'm using Zshell, I need to uh, put this in quotes, and we'll run that. And then we can attach to it using those same parameters or these specific parameters, I should say. Um, so, now if we run this, oh, oops. I forgot to do one thing, it doesn't matter. We can get there from here. All right, so it's connected. And let's see if I can, okay, let's do this, and this, and this, and this, and this, all right, there we go. That's much nicer. All right, so, oh, yeah. Nope, there we go. All right, so if we just do HTTP 8080, there we go. Okay, so now we can break into here. Uh, and this is, again, very simple example, but I like to keep it simple so we can focus on the important stuff and not get distracted. We see right there that we can examine, again, in this case, the bean name of R, uh, as it's operating, and this is of course in the same machine, but it works exactly the same remotely. Uh, and then we can go ahead and uh, we'll do a continue to let it go ahead and run out. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go, there we go. All right, so that's very simply. Um, so there was one, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to show you really quickly before I wrapped up. Uh, so, so here's what the Docker file would be that you would have to create. Uh, again, I, I believe this is, this is uh, at least s mostly documented in the Spring Boot uh, documentation, but uh, the big key is if you want to be able to remotely attach to and, and use this from a container, you have to add this in in the entry point. The same thing, you, you copy it out of uh, the supplied configuration that you created using your IDE. Uh, it's a little more painful, but it does work and it works the same. All right, so with that, let's go back and finish up on the slides and then... Um, We'll see where we go from there. All right, so um, I don't have anything out in the code repository just yet because with a very much hands-on type of presentation, I'm not exactly sure what to put out there, but I will be putting something out there. Uh, if you wanna watch it, star it so you can get notified anytime I update it, uh, by all means do so. If you wanna take the cloud challenge, uh, the AKA MS DevOps uh, cloud challenge that Microsoft is, we are hosting, uh, check it out, test your chops. 
Uh, if you have questions, comments, or feedback later on, by all means, reach out to me by, by email. Best yet, that's why it's biggest, on Twitter, because uh, that's the best way to reach me. Uh, I am here the rest of the week. I do have another talk tomorrow. And um, if you want to join me, it should be fun. We'll be talking about Spring Cloud and, again, 100% live coding, like physically creating applications and, and microservices all the way through. So uh, with that, I think we have like one minute left. And uh, we'll feel, well, I guess, if you have questions, come up and catch me afterward. I, I'll let everybody else go. But thanks so much for coming. Enjoy DevOps. Good to see you in three dimensions. <laughs>